Hello, and welcome to Christian Art in Rome, Two Millennia of Beauty and Devotion. My name is Dr. Katie Clark, and on behalf of the patrons of the arts in the Vatican Museums, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of the patrons and all of our friends and guests joining us today. Thank you for being here. This lecture series is underwritten and presented thanks to the generosity of the New York, California, and Northwest chapters of the patrons. As a nonprofit organization, the patrons exist to preserve, protect, and restore the vast and unique treasures housed in the Vatican Museums in Rome. Today's lecture, St. Peter's Basilica, From the Elegance of the Renaissance to the Explosion of the Baroque, is the third in a four-part series. If you'd like to watch last week's or any previous lectures or rewatch a part of today's, you can always see them online at both the New York and California patrons website, as well as on our YouTube or Facebook pages. We'll show those links at the conclusion of today's talk. Since we're pleased to welcome nearly 500 people to today's talk, your sound and video is turned off. Throughout the lecture today, you can always answer any questions you have into the Q&A box you see on your screen. If you have a technical question, one of our producers will assist you. And if you have a question for Father Michael, we'll collect them and answer as many as we can during our live question and answer period at the end of today's talk. Our presenter today is Father Michael Collins of the Archdiocese of Dublin, a renowned lecturer and author Father Michael has taught and published extensively on a variety of historical and literary subjects. His most recent book, Raphael's World, was released this year as 2020 commemorates the 500th anniversary of the death of the high Renaissance painter, Raphael Sanzio de Arbino. So without further ado, please welcome <clears throat> Father Michael Collins. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be able to join you once more as we explore St. Peter's Basilica. And before we begin, I'd like to dedicate this lecture to uh, a very dear friend of mine, Bruce Halley of Arizona. I knew Bruce for many years and Bruce sadly passed away a couple of years ago and his memory lives on in his family and his wide circle of friends. He was the founder of Discantar and indeed many of your cars may be running on Bruce's product, but he was an extraordinary person he was a philanthropist. He generously supported the restoration of the Pauline Chapel at the Vatican. And I had the privilege of um, being with Bruce and Diane in their home in Arizona on a couple of occasions. And on one occasion, Bruce said to me, he said, Father, you're a pastor in a parish. But he said, I feel in my work, I've got several thousand of parishioners. And they were all the people that he worked with and worked with him. So. I cannot say what a wonderful person he was, how much he was, and I hope that Diane is joining us this afternoon and remembering this wonderful man, the twinkle in his eye and the angelic smile. So here is our first wonderful photograph, and I'm glad to say that over the last couple of weeks, we've had some beautiful photographs, but nothing will compare, I think, to the illustrations that we have to look at today. Now, as you can imagine, uh, going to visit St. Peter's is a long journey. It's a long thing. Many, many people have saved all their lives. They've made just one visit to Rome to go and see St. Peter's, the tomb of the apostle. So it's something, and it's somewhere that requires an enormous amount of time and concentration. But with 40 minutes, we don't have that. So you'll forgive me if I've just taken a few little hidden gems, which you may or may not notice on your visit to Rome. You may have been to St. Peter's, you may be yet waiting to go to St. Peter's. And indeed, a friend of mine, Chantal O'Sullivan of Georgian Antiques called me yesterday and she said, did I miss the trip to Rome? And I said, no, you didn't. And she said, oh, I thought it was last week. And I said, no, well, no, it's not. And I said, there is a good idea. Why don't we make a trip? So we're going and maybe next year you might consider joining us when all of this pandemic is hopefully in the past. Now we're looking up from the rear Tiber and we've seen St. Peter's in its idealized form at the end of a long, long journey. The whole idea of replacing the Constantinian Basilica, which we saw last week, uh, designed by the Emperor Constantine, sometime around 315 to the early 320s, uh, 
The idea was to build just a hall where the Christians would be able to worship and would be able to pray over the tomb of the Apostle Peter. Now, a thousand years later, Pope Nicholas V came along, Tommaso Peronticelli, a great scholar. Uh, he was really interested in the arts, in illustrated manuscripts. And in fact, during his lifetime, uh, Gutenberg developed the movable typeface. So the world suddenly had a jolt into the future. It's a little, by the, little bit like the invention of the internet. And people were able to read uh, mass-produced books, which prior to that had been the preserve of only the educated and largely indeed in Europe of church people. Now, Pope Nicholas was very keen on restoring St. Peter's, <clears throat> but then he decided maybe it would be a better idea to try and replace St. Peter's but he didn't have the time or the resources, even though they'd had a big jubilee year with many thousands of pilgrims coming to Rome in 1450. He didn't have the resources to do what he wanted. And the job of replacing the old basilica, which was showing cracks with the new spanking, uh, shining, sparkling St. Peter's in the full Renaissance style and fashion didn't happen for another half century, more than half a century. Nicholas died in 1455, leaving his plans uh, with Leon uh, Battista Alberti, and nothing else happened. Another big name we're going to find out later on is Paul VI of the Borghese family. He made a huge push to move St. Peter's forward, and it was finally dedicated by Pope Urban VIII, 120 years after its beginning. There were, at minimum, eight arch architects working on this big job, as we're going to see. Well, if it took 120 years, nobody was going to live that long. And the first architect we see in our top left-hand corner is Donato Bramante. He was from Urbino, and he was given the job in 1506 by Pope Julius II to take down the old basilica. Nicholas actually had toyed around with just maybe propping it up and beautifying it on the inside but leaving this, the shell, the central the, the shell, perfectly in place. But with Julius II, Romante had the permission to knock down the whole thing. But he died in 1514, and he was succeeded immediately by the name of the day, the young Raphael Sancio di, da Urbino. And we're going to talk a little bit more about Raphael next week. So we'll move on to Antonio Sangallo, who took over once... Raphael died in 1520. He had a short period of working on the Basilica. And then another big name pushed him off the project, Michelangelo Bonarotti, Michelangelo Bonarotti. Then we come underneath on our second level, we come on our left-hand side to Domenico Fontana, who took over the job. Then we had Carlo Moderno, who took over the job of making the great facade. And then the big name Bernini, we're going to see a lot of in a few moments. And then uh, finally, the Cavaliere d'Arpino, who tried to finish the uh, decoration of the cupola, which again, we're going to examine in a little bit more detail. When Julius II uh, spoke to Bramante, he said, what type of building do we need? And they decided on a Greek-shaped cross, which we'll see in a moment. But Julius gave the permission to go ahead. Uh, the plan here is shown it's a 19th century uh, lithograph, so it's a little bit out of shape and out of style because dressed in green beside the Pope is Michelangelo look, looking on. Uh, he probably wasn't there. Uh, Bramante is showing a plan of St. Peter's, which is not the plan, because in a moment I'm going to show you the real plan. And meanwhile, cheeky Raphael is coming along and saying, oh, by the way, when you finish looking at the plan of knocking down the basilica, I have something else to show you. And they were the great... Uh, bedroom and study that the Pope uh, had ordered him to do as well. So there was a lot of work going on. This is the flowering of the Renaissance in Rome at the time. So on the 18th of April, Easter Sunday, 1506, Pope Julius clambered down into a hole that had been excavated in the choir at the far western end of the Basilica, and he laid the new foundation stone. But as I say, he didn't live to see it because in 1513 he died. Raphael died in 1520 succeeded by Michelangelo, who dies in 1564, and all the way through to the uh, final dedication in 1620. Now, 
Somebody said to me last week, and made a very good point, where is the Vatican? The Vatican is slightly to the northwest of Rome. So if you look at our map, you'll see more or less the area. It's very close to the Tiber River. The Tiber is, uh, runs from the Mediterranean, or into the Mediterranean, of course, I should say. And it runs down to the port of Ostia. But St. Peter's Basilica is not so very far. And the other big monument we'll find in the area is the Castel Sant'Angelo, which was the mausoleum of the Emperor Adrian, a second century emperor. So that's more or less the area. And if you look to your right, you'll see St. Peter's in grey. That's the, what we call the new St. Peter's, even though it's over 500 years old. Um, well, it's not, it's 400 years old, I should say, get my, my maths correct. Uh, and the walls, which are made out in grey, if you look at the orange, gives us an idea. The rest of that, that orange area is all modern Rome, but the whole area that the cursor is passing through at the moment are the Vatican Gardens. And as you know, up in the Vatican Gardens until Thursday, Pope Benedict lived, but he went off to Germany on Thursday to visit his brother Georg, who's very ill at the moment. So he's an absent guest. And then over on our bottom right-hand corner, we've got the Vatican Museums, which many of us are able to visit at our leisure as patrons of the arts. And then finally, we have the great colonnade of Bernini. So that just gives you a little orientation of where we are. As I said, there were various plans. And one of the problems with the Italian architects was, and maybe it's a, a case for all architects, my father was an architect and my brother was an architect. So I've often heard them discuss, I, I used to hear them anyway, discussing plans and ideas for the monuments and for the various things that they intended to do. But always when they got the plan that somebody else had done, they tore it up. And that's exactly the problem they had at the Vatican because Bramante made out his first plan. As you can see, this is a circular plan. If you were to get a compass and go round it, every side will be tipped by the compass. So therefore, it's what we call a Greek cross, equi, equally measured on the four corners. So therefore, it would encompass in a circle. Now, Bramante died, as I say, in 1514, and it passed on to Raphael. And Raphael said, oh, it's so beautiful. Bramante, I couldn't possibly come next now or near him. It's amazing. So he changed it, and he made what we, what we call a Latin cross, which goes a little bit back to the Constantinian decoration as well. A long, long apse, which brings us down, which was very important, of course, for processions and for the liturgy at that time. When he died, we had Fontana, we had San Gallo, Fontana, a number of other architects. And then we came to <clears throat> Michelangelo. And Michelangelo again said, oh, I don't think that's such a good idea. I think we need to go back to the Latin cross, the Greek cross. So he went into the circular cross, and that's the problem. So the, the building is going up and down, in and out, over 120 years. It's amazing they actually got around to finishing it in the first place. They did. Here's an idea of what they were looking at. Now, if you're familiar with St. Peter's, you say, what the heck is that? And that is a plan, more or less what Bernini had in mind. He had these two huge towers which he intended to build in the 1640s. In fact, he built one of them to show Pope Urban VIII, who was his great patron. And when Urban saw the towers, he said, it's dreadful, take it down. And Bernini was mortified, so he hadn't built the other one, but it came down. So that is what St. Peter's almost looked like. And another thing you'll see is the cupola. It's quite different from the cupola that we had. That was lucky we even got the cupola finished. On your right-hand side, we enter the Sala di Constantino, which has just been restored by the New York chapter of the patrons. It's the school of Raphael. Raphael had died in this year, 500 years ago. And the school carried on painting. And that just gives you a little idea of what the interior of St. Peter's was like at that time. Now, they didn't have bull bulldozers. They didn't have huge machinery to come and knock down the building. It was a really slow process. They had to do it with hammers and pixels and push the building down as best they could. So they needed a cathedral, uh, not a cathedral, but they needed a basilica. So they kept up parts and it was just brought down in pieces. And then the new building went up in its place. And if you look down towards the center of the painting, you'll find the the sanctuary over which was built uh, the tomb of St. Peter. So the tomb of St. Peter is underneath and the altar was up above. 
have a quick peek at those little columns. They're called uh, barley, barley um, shaped columns because they kind of twirl their way around and you're going to see them crop up in a surprise in a moment. This is probably the closest that we have to the finished basilica and this was Michelangelo's almost final plan. But I mentioned that he wanted to keep a circular building. So here we have the cupola that he designed. We have the main building. But if you look over on the left-hand side, just go halfway down into the building. And just where the cursor is stopping, it'll go forward another little, onto the next cupola. And that was the area which was the end or the facade which Michelangelo wanted to build. So if you can imagine, they decided that was going to be the end of the basilica. However, Pope Alexander the, uh, Pope, Pope uh, Paul V of the Borghese family decided, no, he wanted something a bit longer. So there was a tussle again between the architects and they finally made it into a Latin cross. And that's more or less what we have today. Again, here's a, an image from the Vatican Museums. It's a contemporary fresco from the 16th century. And this is what the basilica was going to look like. And again, if you've been to St. Peter's or you're familiar with the facade, I think everybody's seen it on television. If you look at that, you'll say, well, that's not what we see today. And one of the things you might notice is that there's no obelisk in the center. And the square is a real square. It's a square shape. It's not a rounded plaza or piazza as we have today. So again, uh, I'm very glad that this guy never got around to being an architect because, because as you can see, he got the cupola completely wrong. He got the building correct and the cupola is, looks as if it's going to fall back into the Vatican Gardens. So fortunately, he failed the audition. So when it was finally finished, the whole basilica was completed and it was dedicated on the 18th of November, 1626. The building was uh, consecrated by Pope Urban VIII, who was a great patron of Bernini. And this is a tapestry, a commemorative tapestry, which was made on, the, just look at this tapestry, because much of it is cloth of gold. It's actually gold and silk threads woven in together, just to give us an idea of the richness of this fabric. And just think at the time, it was so important, because if we're talking the 1620s, this was over a century from the beginning of the Reformation, which had been launched by Martin Luther in 1517. So what was the Pope saying? He's saying 115 years later, we've actually solved all our problems. We're now in charge. We can hold our heads up high. We've battled through this epidemic of heresy. And now we're back in action. And here we have Urban. Uh, tracing out the Greek alphabet in sand, which is part of the ritual for the dedication of the basilica. And I've just shown a little close-up of the deacon who's standing beside the Pope, he's assisting, and he seems a lot more interested in looking at all of us rather than assisting the Pope. I mentioned the bell towers, and again, this is what we're left with, with the bell towers. There are 12 bells hanging in the towers. They range from soprano to a bourdon. The bourdon is the heaviest of the bells and it's, it's rung on Christmas Day, Easter Sunday, anytime the Pope gives the Orbi et Orbi address to the city and to the world, and also on the death of a Pope. So it's a very, very heavy sounding bells. It's a bass bell. And there are two clocks which were put in in the 17th century and they show two uh, times. One is Roman time, and the other is Central European time. The decorations on the top of the basilica are a set of statues of the 12 apostles. At the center stands Christ, and these again were part of the 17th into the 18th century uh, decoration of the facade, which was concluded under Pope Paul VI in the early 17th century. And this was the work of Carlo Moderno, and again, you look at all the architects and you can just see every architect wanted to leave his stamp. But nobody wanted to leave his name bigger than the name we're going to see in a moment. And here we have the balcony, 
which you'll be familiar with, that the Pope addresses us on Easter Sunday, on Christmas Day, and on a number of other occasions, particularly on the day of his election. And if you look up into the enormous inscription, you'll read Paulus Quintus Borgesiensis Romanus, and then it carries on. So this is Paul VI of the Borghese family, Roman, and then it continues with the rest of the inscription around the facade. So I would have thought you'd put the name, oh, St. Peter, or something big like that, but no, this was just to say that Paul was the one who gave, who'd given the final write-off on the facade of the basilica. So we can enter the basilica now, but before we enter in, we'll have a look and we'll see a beautiful mosaic, which is actually a restoration of a work by the early medieval artist, a man called Giotto. You'll be familiar with his work from the Basilica of Assisi, an Umbrian artist, one of the very early at the bridge standing between medieval art into the Renaissance art. And this is the bark of Peter and the miracle of Peter walking on the water when he greets Christ who calls him during a storm. Now this was originally a fresco. It was in the old basilica, which was knocked down by Pope Nicholas V. And this has been covered over with mosaic in order to preserve it. Well, they didn't do a very good job, obviously, because the fresco has more or less vanished. And now we have the mosaic, but at least we have the design which was made out by Giotto. So as we leave that, that's uh, in the interior porch, and it's actually overlooking the door with which we finished last week, the door of Filarete. And now we're able to enter into the basilica, going through the doors magically. And I couldn't find an image which was so, so beautiful as this. This is by Gianpaolo uh, Panini, an 18th century painter of landscapes and of architectural buildings. And this is a wonderful view, an elevated view down into St. Peter's. It's, it's a magnificent oil, and it gives us an idea of what it must have been like in the 18th century while he was painting. Today, St. Peter's can very often be overcrowded with tourists and pilgrims, and can be maybe a little bit unpleasant as an exercise. Um, there's a little bit of crowd control. Until about 10 years ago or so, most of the ushers were Italians, and it was a very coveted job. But I do notice that nowadays when you go in, you'll find Africans and Filipinos and all sorts of nations who are ushers to the Basilica. And I was asking somebody recently why that was, and they explained to me that Pope Francis uh, one day remarked that it all seemed to be a cartel sewn up between the Italians. And he said, why don't you allow some of the unemployed people or the migrants get jobs here? So it's really great to see all the nations of the world represented as welcomers or ushers in the Basilica. Over on your right-hand side, there's uh, a tiny little detail, which was painted by Panini 200 years ago. It's a water font. It's a tiny little water font, and the enlargement is over on our right-hand side. However, now we're going to see what the real thing is, what it's like. The real statue is made in marble, and this is a holy water stoop. Here's a little angel. Actually, there's two putti, or little angels, who hold up the shell that the holy water is put into. You would go up to this angel, and if the angel stood up to greet you and shake hands, that angel would be over six and a half feet tall. But because everything in the basilica, it's a Baroque building, because everything is in perspective and everything is in harmony, therefore you don't really notice it. So this huge statue of the angel uh, would really be enough to knock you out but it's, it's beautifully polished and it's beautifully finished. But that's just to give us a little idea as we carry on. In a moment or two, you'll find there's a lot of angels in that basilica, but I wanted to show you this detail from the cupola, which we're going to visit in a moment or two, because this is a mosaic. And again, if you look down to the right-hand side of your building, of the picture that we're looking at, you'll find a couple of models who've been included in the image and that will show you how enormous this is. So that angel, if they were to stand up, would be about 14 foot high. But you're looking from the ground up into the cupola, so therefore it all looks in harmony and in perspective. As we enter into the chapel, 
of the baptism, which is the first chapel on the left-hand side going into St. Peter's on the side, the left side aisle, we come to the chapel of the baptism. Over the baptismal font, which we'll talk about in a moment, is a painting by Maratta made in the early 18th century. It was an oil painting. But this, if you look carefully, is a mosaic copy. So, why did they do that? Part of the reason was canvases over the years, whether we like it or not, they change color, the varnish darkens, and we lose the luster. And in the 18th century, the Vatican, the fabric of the basilica decided that they would employ artists who would preserve the oil paintings in mosaic. So therefore the original of this by Maratta was taken over to Santa Maria degli Angeli near Termini station and is in the basilica there. And this is a mosaic copy. So look at the side and you'll find the feet of Jesus in the Jordan as he's baptized by his cousin John. And then look down below at the other detail and see the water flowing around the foot of Christ. And all of that is mosaic. Now, in order to make a perfect copy of the oil painting, the Vatican Mosaic Studio had to invent 27,000 shades of color. Now, we've only five prim three primary colors and, and five main colors, but they had to invent 27,000 shades. And a couple of years ago, when I was a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago or so, when I was preparing a book on the Vatican, I visited the Vatican studio, the mosaic studio, and the director showed me drawers of mosaic, uh, their, their long lengths of the, of the glass filament, which have been made in rods. And then as they need to repair it, they cut the little rod and they go and repair the little part. Because from time to time, as you can imagine, it's like a jigsaw, little pieces will fall from the, from the picture onto the ground. So if it gets lost or if it gets damaged, they go and do the restoration. And that, of course, is part of what the whole uh, patron's mission is, to support this work, to make sure that it can all go ahead. But imagine to think that 400 years ago, they got enough intelligence to make extra mosaic tiles just in case they needed to do this. So I asked him how long they could go on for, and he said, well, I guess another 500 years. So that's pretty good value. If you look down below at the basin, you'll see it's actually a porphyry uh, basin and it was used as the lid of the Emperor Otto II. But prior to that, it's believed it probably was the lid of the sarcophagus of Adrian, which is in Castel Sant'Angelo. And next week I'll show, you, I'll show you some images of Castel Sant'Angelo, which is close to St. Peter's on the river. And then uh, Carlo Fontana made this great bronze lid which would stand over it. And I think it's very beautiful there because originally the porphyry basin was the lid of the sarcophagus so therefore it was a symbol of death and of course now being turned upside down it becomes a container for the waters of baptism which is the image of eternal life. So again there's great theology behind all these works. Now I want to just show you this tomb because this is the tomb of um, Pope Innocent VIII of the Chibo family. And an important thing about him was that uh, he lived at the time when Columbus went off to discover a new route to the Spice Islands. He thought he was going south. He wanted to go and find a cheaper and safer route than rather, rather than follow the overland Silk Road. And he also wanted to find a route which would be free of pirates. Now, as we know, the story is that he went over uh, and discovered the new world in 1492. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and he discovered America. Well, as we know, of course, it was St. Brendan of Galway in Ireland who had discovered America probably in the sixth century. And he enjoyed his vacation and then he came home, a wise man, he came home to live in Ireland. But he had a lovely time over in the States, which is good. But this was the man who was the Pope during the time when the Americas were discovered. He died actually in August. And of course, Columbus didn't arrive in the, in the States until October in Hispaniola, in the Dominican Republic. That seems to be the, uh, the agreement of, of facts. And this is a tomb which was made in the High Renaissance, is in the early High Renaissance period by Antonio Pagliolo. It shows 
the Pope's seated. He's holding uh, what seems to be like a trowel, but actually it's supposed to be the lance or the, uh, the head of the lance, which the centurion allegedly called Longinus pierced the side of Christ with. And these are just details of the tomb, which indeed was also just restored about 15 years ago. As you look down into the Basilica now, we see the great Baldacchino of Bernini. In 1623, when Pope Urban VIII was elected, Matteo Barberini, he called the young 20-year-old Gian Lorenzo, well, 25-year-old Gian Lorenzo Bernini, to see him, and he said, I want you to make a canopy over St. Peter's tomb. And Bernini already had four contracts. He did a Daphne, a Persephone, he did Aeneas, and a David to carry out. And those are in the Borghese Gallery, if you get the opportunity to see them. So he was under contract to finish those, but he undertook to make the designs for this. Now, the problem was Bernini was a sculptor. He wasn't an architect. But nevertheless, he had a pretty good idea of how to do these things. And he laid out the foundations. He had to dig into the ground. And it was actually during the excavations that they discovered the old St. Peter's, which had been covered up and forgotten about for hundreds upon hundreds of years. So the, the monument caused the discovery of the old St. Peter's. But they couldn't really waste too much time because they needed to get this done. The bronze for this work, they say it's around uh, seven thousand tons, uh, sorry, 7,000 kilos uh, of bronze for this, was taken from Venice, bought in Venice, and also a certain amount of the bronze was taken from the rafters of the Pantheon in Rome. So it was melted down, fused, and made into this four-columned canopy. Now on the right-hand side you'll see a close-up, and there was no kiln or oven which would be large enough to pour in the molten metal into a mold. So therefore, Bernini had to settle for making the columns in three parts. So the lower part is the circular part. I mentioned the barley-shaped columns. And these are actually a replica of the ones which stood in St. Peter's Basilica. So if you look up into the uh, niches on either side in the distance, they are the old columns which were taken by Bernini and placed up in these niches. So the whole monument was then placed together. It took nine years to design and cast. And if we look at the plinth on which the large canopy is set, you'll find that uh, Bernini used a, a large brick base. And as we now look at the uh, papal coat of arms, you'll find a little story that Bernini put in. So if we could move on to the next slide. In a moment, uh, I'm sorry I got that wrong. Just this is a little uh, view of the angels which stand at the top. These are uh, angels which are the trumpets um, which are guarding the Eucharist. Bernini threw in a couple of little ideas that he wanted. Remember, it was very rare for people and artists to sign their work. So therefore, he put in his rosary beads. And on the rosary beads was a medal of Pope Urban VIII, who'd been his commissioner, and a little lizard and a son. Urban was very suspicious, um, not suspicious, superstitious. So he had looked to his astrologers to find which was the most appropriate day, and it was decided the most appropriate day was the 29th of June, Feast of St. Peter and Paul. And having taken that advice, then that was the day in which this was. Uh, dedicated. But as we look at the plinth in, in the uh, Baldacchino, we'll find a little story that Bernini, Bernini wanted to commemorate. The Pope's niece had had a child, and Bernini wanted to commemorate that. So as we go around the altarpiece, you'll find various images of the princess Barberini having the baby. So it's her moments of pregnancy during the nine months. So you see her hair becomes matted and then she's crying out in travail as she prepares to give birth. And then the little boy arrives, the young little prince, and he's shown a bonny lass, a bonny, a bonny lad, 
and then on the right hand side you'll see uh, as the womb contracts after the birth. Bernini has also shown that as well. His great patron Alexander the, the seventh was of the Chigi family of Siena, a very very wealthy family. Bernini had been commissioned when he was in his 70s to make this for Pope Alexander but by the time he got around to it Alexander had died Alexander had asked him during his lifetime. Alexander died and Bernini was too old to really work on this. So he, dealed it, he dealt it out among his studio and he got a number of artists to design the statues of truth, justice, charity and um, of peace. And now we see the Pope is kneeling between these four virtues. But if you look underneath the canopy, which is made up of 127 pieces of Sicilian jasper marble, you'll see the skeleton of death peering out. But his head is covered by the marble canopy. It looks almost like cloth, but his head is covered by the marble canopy. Because as it says in the gospels, we know not the hour nor the day, and therefore we have to be ready at every moment for the time when we've got to say farewell to this world and to enter eternity. I mentioned that everything in the Basilica, apart from one oil painting in the Blessed Sacrament Chapel, is mosaic. And just to show how the Basilica is keeping up to date, on your left hand side you'll see one of the small little cupolas we've seen outside that architectural drawing. Uh, the cupolas, small little cupolas, and in 2017, a German lighting firm uh, reorganized the basilica and gave a new set of lighting. So on the left, left hand side, you see what it's like today, but on the right hand side, you see it without the same dome, without the lighting. So it's much darker, and it's the, I, I think it's, it's wonderful to think that all the time we're making improvements, improvements. And again, in this work of restoration, which has been carried out through the patron's office by uh, your contributions, and also by the museum restoration uh, force and the fabric of St. Peter's, are all the time improving, preserving, and presenting for the next generations. One of the great works of Bernini, again, was the altar of the chair. Here's a, another theological idea. Bernini wanted to show an idea of the teaching authority of the church. So we call the Pope infallible, but that's only in the area of faith and morals. So if the Pope were to say in the morning, from now on, everybody should eat yellow tomatoes, nobody would pay attention to him. But if he gives us directions about what's right and what's wrong in the area of morality, or in the central teaching of our faith, well, then we listen to him. So it's a bit like, you know, the way in a university you've got the chair of mathematics, the chair of science, the chair of languages, etc. Well, here we have the chair, which indicates St. Peter, and he's supported by four doctors of the church. And the doctors of the church, um, John Chrysotham, Augustine, Ambrose, Ambrose and Augustine are at the front wearing the, uh, the mitres, and they are called the Western doctors. And the Greek doctors, two doctors, are at the back holding up the chair. But you see, they barely, barely tip the chair as they hold it up. And overlooking the whole chair is what's called the burst of glory. So on the left hand side, we see the chair and Peter receiving the symbolic keys of the kingdom of authority of teaching from Christ. And this, this enormous burst of the Holy Spirit. And the whole idea here that Bernini is trying to get across is that the Pope acts as the successor of Peter. He preserves and unifies the church in communion with the bishops, who are all successors of the 12 apostles. All of this is done under the light of God's guidance in the Holy Spirit, the wisdom of God. And by the way, that is not glass, that is marble. It's alabaster marble, which is cut into very thin slices and has become translucent so we can see through the the window to the outside and thus receive the light from outside into, into the basilica. Uh, 
The obelisk, which we're very familiar with in the plaza, was taken from the old uh, circus of Nero that we saw in our first meeting. And then it was brought into the square of St. Peter's in um, 1588 by Pope, Pius, by Pope Sixtus V. And he wanted to put the obelisk in the center and it was carried out by the architect Fontana. It was a very difficult job because pulling this thing into the basilica, well, into the uh, center of the plaza was quite uh, an enterprise. You can see with all the people uh, who've been called into work, there's horses and mules and they're all pulling ropes, etc. And he, indeed the Pope said, he gave orders that nobody was to talk because if they did, they would be excommunicated because they break the concentration of the sailors of Misnum who'd come up to uh, put the obelisk into place. But as the obelisk was being uh, hoisted into place, the ropes began to fray and one of the, the, the sailors shouted out, water the ropes. So they threw water on the ropes and the rope became taut again and they were able to carry on. And the Pope, instead of excommunicating the sailor, gave him and his family permission to sell palm on Palm Sunday in St. Peter's uh, Square in perpetuity. And I don't know if the family are still around, but if they were, they could make quite a pretty scent on that work. This is where the uh, obelisk stood. But as you can see from a contemporary painting of the 16th century, the rest of the basilica was rising. This is a good example of building the cupola. The cupola is way in the background, but the front hasn't been knocked down yet. So it was such a difficult job to put up the new part and take down the old part at the same time. When Nicholas was doing his work, uh, they'd actually destroyed half the Colosseum to get the marble in order to build the new basilica. We come to one of the most marvelous works in the whole of the basilica, and this is the Pietà made by Michelangelo when he was between the age of 24 and 25 when the Cardinal Belair, Jean de Belair, had asked him to make a mortuary chapel, and he made this wonderful statue of the Pietà, the sadness of Mary and Jesus. It was the night of the crucifixion. The body of Jesus had been taken from the cross and laid on Mary's shoulder. And I often think when I look at this beautiful statue of, the, of Mary, the joy of having a little baby all those years ago, then her son had lived his life, he taught his message, he'd done good, even done miracles, and yet he faced a dreadful death. Michelangelo, apparently, according to the legend, uh, got the body of a young Jewish man who had died, and mortality was quite high in those days, so it probably wasn't a difficult job to get. And he carved this magnificent statue where Jesus is about five foot ten inches, but Mary, if she was to stand, would be almost seven feet tall. And the reason for that is he wanted to show the strength of Mary holding the bruised and battered body of the, of the son. And yet Mary shows no wrinkle in her face because it was believed that virginity preserved her from pain in this world. But there's an immense pathos, and with these images, we see Mary, the mother of Christ, Mary, mother of us all. Michelangelo was asked where he got the inspiration, and he said, well, I went up to the quarry in Carrara, which is on the western coast of Italy. And he said, I waited a few months until I found the block that I wanted. And then I saw the figures inside it one day at sunset. And all I had to do was take them out. But he wasn't so uh, blasé because he actually, according to Vasari, he heard some people saying, oh, this is by an artist from Lombardy. And he came back and he carved his name, possibly that evening, on the girdle of Mary, Michelangelo Bonarotti may fetch it. Michelangelo of Florence Bonarotti made me. And it's the only signed work after that he never signed his work. <laughs> 
but this is the, the last great work that he came to uh, participate on. He was asked by the Pope to finally finish the cupola. And he chose to make a cupola in two parts. There's an interior cupola and there's an exterior cupola. And between the two shells is a staircase. So you can actually climb these if, if you have the inclination. You can climb up, but they were also made in order to allow air circulate and allow the workmen access to the cupola as, as first of all it has been made and then it will be repaired. And there's this enormous big sunburst where the angels and saints populate, populate the skies and the drum of the basilica uh, of the cupola was put in at the very last moment and that was the crowning glory of the cupola of Michelangelo. Now, because Carlo Moderno had lengthened the basilica, we don't really see what the basilica looked like until we go into the Vatican Gardens. And then from our vantage point in the Vatican Gardens, you'll be able to see how the cupola looked from the exterior and how somebody approaching, even from the Tiber, would look up and they would see the cupola as it is. But unfortunately, if you've been to St. Peter's, you might notice that it's a little bit dwarfed. The final part of the work of St. Peter's was given to Bernini as well, and he was asked to make a great space in which to welcome the crowds of people who would gather to salute the Pope. And these are based on two drawings of the idea that Bernini had. He wanted to make the arms welcoming the people in, and he said the church is like the mother welcoming in her flock, her family. And so he's made this image of Peter, uh, a crucified Peter, because it brings us back to the tradition that Peter was crucified near or in the circus of Nero. And he's shown opening his arms in welcome to the place where we all gather. The colonnade was made, uh, 244 columns and 92 pilasters were made out for this great embrace, which was made by Bernini under the patronage of the great wealthy banker family, the Kiji, Alexander, had got his family to uh, pay for this. And this is the colonnade with which we're so familiar and where people gather for all the big events in papal and Christian history. But there is a last work I wanted to finish with today, and that is uh, by Timothy Schmaltz, a Canadian paint, uh, artist, he's a sculptor, who has done some very, very beautiful work. And this was asked for by Pope Francis. This was his little contribution. And every Pope brings in something of their way of looking at life. And as we know, Pope Francis is very keen to support the poor and the migrants. And I love this piece of work. It stands in the colonnade, it stands beside the colonnade, it stands in St. Peter's Square. And it shows us all the poor and fortunate people bedraggled from every race, from every religion. They're, they're refugees. They're people who are trying to get to make a new life, to get a new start. And I think it's, it's a lovely tribute as well also to the work of Pope Francis because he installed in the colonnade about four years ago a barber's, uh, a little hospital, a dentist's studio and uh, a food bank. So underneath the arms of the colonnade, now we're doing exactly what Jesus had wanted from the very beginning 2,000 years ago, to feed the poor, to help the afflicted, and to bring us ultimately to heaven. So thank you very much for joining in this afternoon's meeting. And I just leave you with this lovely image. We began on the bridge of the Tiber, and just about 15 minutes ago, and we're going to look from the top of St. Peter's Cupola down in the city of Rome, Orbi at Orbi. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Father. We're going to take some questions now. So if you've got a question, please go ahead and type it into that Q&A box that you see, and we'll get to as many as we can. All right, our first question um, 
is a question about the mosaics and we want to know what material was used to adhere mosaic pieces to the composition. So what they did was um, they made it very simple for themselves. They put on a concrete base. So therefore it's like a plaster base, um, which is with lime and with grit and sand. And that was plastered onto the wall. So it's almost like a glue. So therefore the mosaics are set. And the interesting thing, the mosaics are all glass, colored glass, with the exception of gold, but all the others are, are just uh, different colored glass. And of course, every tiny little square is cut irregularly, so no square is the same as the other. And then when they're placed into the moist concrete prior to its setting, they're never set on a, on a, on a, a level, they're, they're never set flat. And that's why all the mosaics glisten and catch the light as we look at them. All right, we have a question about uh, Julius II. So you mentioned last week that everyone was terrified of Julius. Um, and we want to know, was that true of even luminaries like Raphael and Michelangelo? Yes, he was a pretty cantankerous person. And again, we have contemporary stories about uh, even the Sistine Chapel and the way he treated Michelangelo. Um, there's a contemporary story which says that he got so annoyed with Michelangelo on one occasion that he beat him. And Michelangelo fled to Florence and had to wait until the Pope's temper had abated. But he was a very irascible person. But again, you know, when you research into this, you'll find that the reason that Julius was so belligerent was also because he believed that the church needed independence. That's why it had the papal states. And he wanted to defend it from all the crooks who had taken and eaten little portions of it. So I, I think uh, Julius was terrible. He was um, awe-inspiring, but sometimes he had reason. We have a question about uh, the cupola. So James wants to know, why do, we, why do we call it a cupola as opposed to a dome? Uh, well, it's, it's just an Italian word, and it, it's just an Italian word for dome, so really it, they're interchangeable. Got it. Uh, Juan wants to know, is there a list of the saints in the piazza on the pillars? Uh, no, not on the pillars, but there's 144 saints which are over the colonnade. And each of those has been identified. And I remember years ago when I lived in Rome, meeting a German student who'd done his doctoral thesis on identifying all the statues, because there is a document which gives an indication. Uh, so yes, each of those statues. And an interesting thing about the saints is, keep in mind, most of the people that were looking at the artwork uh, four or five hundred years ago were illiterate. Very few people were able to read. And that's why, just for an example, just a random example, Peter is always shown with a big mop of curly hair and a beard, but he always wears a yellow cloak and a blue tunic and carries keys in his hand, a gold and a silver key. So a person who is illiterate, who wasn't able to read, would immediately say, ah, that's St. Peter. St. Paul carrying the sword. St. Agnes carrying a sheep. You know, so all of these are, they carry a symbol and every, every statue, every religious painting would be read by contemporary five, six hundred years ago without any difficulty. A couple of more questions about identifying some statues. So we want to know who are the statues on top of the entrance to the Vatican? So um, Christ in the center and then on either side. And, and then the 12 apostles. A uh, good question now, I'm beginning to wonder, uh, was Judas there? I'd have to do my counting, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go back, or you might like to do that, go on the internet and find a, an image of, of the facade, and maybe we'll find the apostles there, how many there were. And Josephine has a question about the altar of the chair. So um, of the four doctors of the church, we talked about the, the two Western doctors. Could you uh, tell us who the other two are? Yes, uh, St. John Chrysostom, and then of a blank. Um, I can't remember who the fourth one. I think it was... Uh, Athanasius. No, okay. Athanasius, correct. That's who it was, Athanasius. So these were kind of... Um, they, they also are important because in 1054, there was a split between Constantinople and Rome, and that wasn't healed until 1964 uh, between Athanagoras and Pope Paul VI, when Pope Paul traveled to Jerusalem. So just think, there was a thousand years of a family dispute 
So I think if anybody has a row with their husband or wife or kids, it's, it's uh, important to remember that eventually, it might take a thousand years, but it can be healed. We have a question about the, the duration of, of construction. So obviously it took 120 years to build the new basilica. So where did people worship while the new church was being constructed? Uh, that's a great question. They just worshipped in the small side chapels. And in fact, when you go into St. Peter's, it's 770 feet long. Uh, from the ceiling to the dome, it's 448 feet high. So there are a number of lateral chapels and they just went in and had their ceremonies there. Um, the Pope didn't go to St. Peter's, of course, very often in those days. Most of the ceremonies were carried out in the Apostolic Palace, either in the Sistine Chapel or the Nicholas V Chapel or the Urban VIII Chapel. So the Pope didn't attend St. Peter's all that often, but it, it was really, you kind of think, did they know what they were getting themselves into? Were they biting too much off uh, before they did it? And I guess probably if they knew it was going to take 120 years, they'd have said, oh, forget it, let it fall down, then we'll build a new one. But it just shows these people were custodians. The Pope sees himself as a custodian of the church. He's not just an innovator. He's also a guardian. Well, and to that point, we have another question about how, how is the funding for this massive project handled over the years? Because it, the budget had to have been incredible. It was enormous. Actually, this is a great question. And I'll tip on it next week when we come to talk about Leo the Great, uh, Leo the Tenth and Clement the Seventh. Um, it was through the sale of indulgences. And in fact, that was one of the sparks of the Reformation because uh, who's a German friar, Johannes Tetzel, a Dominican, who uh, he'd gone to sell indulgences on behalf of Albrecht, the Archbishop of Madeburg, and of Pope Leo X, uh, in order to raise funds for the Diocese of Madeburg, which Albrecht, the Archbishop, had to pay back to the Roman Curia, and Leo, who was raising money for the Basilica. So, in a sense, the Basilica was one of the collateral causes of the Reformation. Hmm. But there was other, I should say, there was other ways of getting money and many bankers lent funds to the Basilica and there was a whole department of what was called the Most Reverend Fabric of the, Saint, of the Basilica of St. Peter's and one of their jobs 500 years ago, like the patron's office today, was fundraising. So going around telling people of the great work that was going on and when you think about it, um, it was a wonderful thing to be able to contribute because if those people of their generosity and very often of meager means hadn't been able to do that, we wouldn't have this marvelous building, which, as I mentioned, with the relighting of 2017 and with the, with the cleaning of the exterior of the Basilica, which is still ongoing, it started in 1998 and it's still going on 22 years later. So um, it's thanks to the generosity of these people that this work was made and is maintained. Well, and I think that's a, a perfect place to leave it. Obviously, we have a number of other questions, so we're going to keep track of all those and make sure that we get answers to everybody who's asked a question. Thank you so much for, for submitting those, and we'll make sure we get back to you by email with a response. So thank you again uh, for the generous sponsorship of this series by the New York, California, and Northwest chapters. Thank you certainly to all the patrons and guests who are joining us, and thank you especially to Father Michael Collins for another fascinating lecture. I hope you'll join us next Saturday at the same time for the final lecture in this series, The Banker's Son and the Most Unfortunate Pope, Raphael's Great Patrons. We'll meet two Medici Popes, Pope Leo X and Clement VII, both cousins and generous patrons of Raphael and other artists. In this year, which marks five centuries since the death of the great Raphael, we acknowledge these extraordinary and contrasting churchmen from luxurious excess to the dramatic challenges of the Reformation, their contribution shape the arts of the Vatican. And a new series sponsored by the California and Northwest chapters will begin in July on Saturdays at the same time. So that's 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern, and 9 p.m. for our friends in Europe. This seven part lecture series is entitled A Shadow of Divine Perfection, which is a phrase that Michelangelo used, and explores the world of Italian art in the Renaissance and Baroque. Presented by Dr. Rocky Ruggiero, it is also, of course, free to patrons and to our friends and guests, and we hope you'll join us. You can register now at californiapatrons.org slash lecture series.
Thank you so much for joining us. As always, you can watch video from today and previous lectures online at the links you see at the bottom of your screen. We appreciate your time and we'll see you next week.